Today on The Topping Show, Bud Light CEO has a meltdown during an interview and may even rehire Dylan Mulvaney. Google drops sponsorship of an anti-Christian drag event. Feds claim that Florida property ban won't stand. Costco to crack down on membership sharing. Volvo is the latest auto company to adopt the Tesla plug. Apple inches forward towards a $3 trillion evaluation. DraftKings dropped the bid for a point bet. And Yamaha is killing their snowmobile division. All that and much, much more on The Topping Show. Thank you for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see the founder at least twice a day. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, that's the joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner and need a little assistance, you reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going on to the business part of the podcast, you have DraftKings dropping their bid for Point Bet's U.S. assets. Now, the company by the name of Fanatics originally made the offer for the U.S. assets of Point Bet's, but then after that, DraftKings came in with a higher bid in an attempt to win more gambling assets so people could spend more copious amounts of hard-earned income on gambling on sports balls. Which, again, that's a nice way of saying moronic. Foolish? If you look at the people who win consistently, the DraftKings and all these different types of gambling mechanisms, the people who win these games, again, I have to reiterate this, the people who consistently every year make the most amount of money on those platforms, they're not, they're not sports fans. They're not someone who goes to the game every single day and it's just they're putting together a roster or analyze, they're looking at all the players, look at their favorites. They're IT guys. They did an interview with the gentleman who's consistently won the number one winner of dollars on DraftKings and he just has a computer and he literally just developed his own software to ingest every piece of data he could possibly get from the player's pitch speed to how they curve the ball to the weather to the rotation of the earth's axis well maybe maybe the last part's made up but nevertheless he developed his own software so that the technology would tell him which picks to make because they have the highest probability of winning and he's consistently the number one winner so that's why i'm always so perplexed when people throw their money at these types of things thinking they're going to make it rich it's one thing to have a fun little draft event with the guys and you just everyone puts in 20 bucks and it's just with friends but you're, these types of big entities you're going up against a computer software so again it's one of those things where Brilliant business idea. DraftKings is a brilliant company. They found a niche in the market and they are expanding exponentially. But from a consumer perspective, I wouldn't recommend it. And it looks like after they withdrew their bid, DraftKings stock dipped about 1.16%. So not crazy, but a little bit of a dip. Now, other interesting stock news, you have Apple inching their way towards a $3 trillion evaluation. I also have to remind people, they're one of the most profitable companies in history. I believe it was 2019, they're the most profitable company on the planet. They're more profitable than oil companies. So oil co it blows my mind. They're more profitable than oil companies, defense industry. Like every other industry is nothing compared to it. Granted, those are the publicly traded companies that we know about, but the most profitable company ever, which is why I'm always, if you see here, this is a PC. That's why I'm always a little skeptical of buying Apple products because I just I know it is more than 50% of profit for the company. And in terms of the speeds and feeds, I usually prefer Android PC. But I understand there's an application just like all IT and all many things in life. There's a time and place. It's all about the application, the use case. But but still, Apple is inching now towards a three trillion evaluation. In the past couple of days, their stock hit $188.93 per share. And they only need to hit the share price in order to get that evaluation. It just has to hit $190.73. At which point they will be valued at $3 trillion on the stock market, which is a huge achievement and another, you know, kudos to American based company. Now, it'd be interesting to see if they could hit that. If you look at their historicals, I mean, it's one of those things where, uh, yeah. The odds are definitely in their favor. They just keep coming out with more and more and more products that 
people just love buying and they do make some good products. Now, in terms of historicals, they hit their 1 trillion mark August 2nd, 2018. Then fast forward to August 20th, 2020, they hit the $2 trillion mark. But then in January 2nd, 2022, they missed their $3 trillion mark evaluation. So it seems every two years they're doing phenomenal and they just barely missed it in 2022. Yeah, if I were gambling man, which I don't recommend, but, and again, I'm not a financial analyst or a fiduciary or, you know, talk to your accountant if you want to buy stocks or, you know, or invent your own algorithm and software, they'll do it. But yeah, it looks like they're, they're probably gonna hit that number. Now, other interesting business news, you have Volvo finally making the decision of choosing Tesla for the standard for their charging plugs and their infrastructure. Now, this will give Tesla owners access to 17,000 Tesla chargers, and they're joining all the other major companies that are quickly adapting Tesla. You have Ford, General Motors, as well as Rivian, all the recent major automotive companies have signed up saying we're going to use the Tesla plugs and the Tesla network in order to facilitate our needs for our clients. It's a nice way of saying we weren't smart enough to do it first, and Tesla has a majority market share. And Tesla is only doing this because there's quite literally not millions, there are billions of dollars at risk here. The reason Tesla opened it up so that it's possible for other networks and other car companies to do this is because now Tesla is now able to achieve, or rather receive, billions of dollars in tax subsidies tax subsidies as the United States government is incentivizing the development and the expansion of these EV charging networks. How those networks will get where there's power where the power will come from to get those networks? Let's not worry about that. Don't think about that. Think about this area. Just look, look here. It's shiny. Don't think about the fact that realistically right now the only way to you probably need to be prudent to build out the infrastructure to en create energy, like nuclear power, which Right now is the best ROI, and it's even green. People say you know you can't recycle. Oh, quite the contrary. Depleted uranium is one of the most dense substances on the planet and used for tank busters, which basically you know penetrate the tank armor. But I digress. Now, it also noted that they will say that the what was this? The Tesla Next charging design was proprietary until last year when they wanted to get the government subsidies. So not too surprising that Volvo is going to go in on that as well. Now, other interesting business news, you have Costco is trying to crack down on their memberships, or rather their membership sharing, which you're, you're probably seeing a trend here. You have most other companies doing the same thing, whether it's Google, you have Netflix, they're cracking down on that password sharing. Because again, the only thing harder than rate, one way to piss off a lot of customers is raising prices. Another thing you could do that make your company more profitable is close off some of these already frown, that's already frowned upon, but it's already a, uh, I guess it's against company policies. It's not against the law to do this, I don't think. Certainly you should be more, you should be ostracized from society from doing it in terms of morally you're stealing. But when asked about, you know, why, why choosing to do this now, a Costco representative told Business Insider, quote, we don't feel it's right that non-members receive the same benefits and pricing as our members, unquote, which, yes, absolutely. That's that's the whole point of Costco. So that makes 110%. Now, they further clarify, they said, quote, as we already asked for the membership card at checkout, we are now asking to see their membership card and their photo at our self-service checkout registers, unquote. They clarified that they've seen a lot of they see this as a way to reduce shoplifting as well as unauthorized purchases. And yeah, obviously they need to do this because if you look at the business model of Costco, same thing with Target, or I was about to say Target, same thing with Sam's Club. So yeah, that's way off because Sam's Club is Walmart and they're owned by them. But the way they make their money is the membership fee. The actual profit per unit sold isn't that great. And that's why the CEO and the founder of Costco is so fervent about working with the suppliers and the vendors to get the best deal for his customers. He negotiates the best deals, get the price down as much as possible, to get the best value, because he knows he's not gonna make a profit on that item. That at most the item's gonna pay for the hourly workers at the Costco and maybe some like, you know, the little overhead of the stores. The only way they can actually sustain and grow their business is with the membership fees. Now, they have some cool names for these membership fees. They have the membership fee at used to be called the the gold star in business cards and i believe those are only 60 dollars per year and then they have the executive membership card for 120 dollars per year 
So it's not like it's gonna break someone's bank, but for Costco, it quite literally makes them, I believe, it's, I believe the last quarter is a little under, under a billion dollars in revenue from those cards. It's the key to the business working. Without those cards, with people going in and just buying stuff, they are losing money every time it happens. So you're gonna see more and more of this as businesses are trying to remain profitable while also not trying to increase prices too much because customers are very, financially prudent customers are price sensitive. So if something goes up by a certain percentage or a certain amount of money, they're not going to buy the same quantity or they might not buy the product at all given the circumstances. But time shall tell, we'll see. Given the popularity of Costco, this will just make them more profitable. And obviously we need to squish out those thieves, so to say. Now, going on to the culture part of the podcast, you have the Bud Light CEO having a meltdown during a fascinating interview when they were talking about, you know, what's going on? What are you gonna do? Uh, did you do anything wrong? Anything you regrets? And keep in mind, he worked at the CIA for about, I believe it was four to six years. Although on the upside, he is a veteran. He is a United States Marine. So there's a little, he has some redeeming uh, characteristics, some might say. And when they asked him if they fired the two marketing geniuses, the Alyssa Heinerschild, who her name will be down, written down the history books or more accurately, the internet and business classes for decades as someone who destroyed $20 billion in stock evaluation and millions upon millions of billions in sales. It was her that was supposedly fired as well as the person who was dumb enough to hire her, which his name was Dennis. Now, we have been told for months that they are not fired, they are on a leave of absence. Yesterday, we had a, thanks to a leak with a confidential informant at the company, we know that they were let go and they even got a copy of the org chart and they're not there. And the telltale sign in corporate America, if you have the org structure chart where it says, you know, Bob reports to Sean, Sean reports to Bob, you know, to Dennis, what have you. When you have names removed from the org chart, that's kind of the final, that is the final nail in the coffin for you now, you're no longer at that company. And the people who were assigned to Dennis as well as Alyssa, they're now assigned to other people. Now, that being said, today, when, when, during this interview, the, the Bud Light CEO fervently said they are not fired. They're on a leave of absence. And apparently there's rumors that Alyssa has spoken with her friends and she's not allowed to say anything. And it gets even more bizarre. So when they asked him specifically, hey, would you do another marketing campaign with Dylan Mulvaney and put another can on it? The CEO, Brandon Whitworth, just totally jumped into a pre-rehearsed, ridiculous speech about having a social conversation. And he didn't say he would not work with Dylan again. And he's very, very prudently trained by the CIA or maybe just other politicians because if you read between the lines, I don't think he's gonna rehire Dill Mulvaney or more controversial figures, but he's just really good at speaking but not saying anything. So releasing very small bits of data. I, if I was the interviewer, I almost wanna ask him, what's your favorite color? And if he says like, you know, blue or rainbow, I would just simply say, well, I, I had to ask, I thought I might get one honest answer out of you, but given your track record, that's probably a lie too. But time shall tell. Their beer sales, again, are now down 28.5%, which is ridiculous. And he is very proud about the fact that they're gonna spend three times as much as they normally do on marketing this summer. And they're like quite literally giving beer away with the $15 million rebate for a 15 pack of beer. And he's all about, they're, they're going hard on the Twitter, putting more and more ads out or tweets as the youth call it. And of course they're viscerally ratioed as more and more people critique them. And the critique of the actual tweets from Bud Light are more popular than the actual Bud Light post itself. And he keeps saying, you know, he, he really wants to focus on his employees and the ecosystem. And you see this in his commercials where they're, they're highlighting, oh, we're a beer company. You know, here's Bob, he works as a distributor. He's not an employee, but he's family because Bob, he transports our swill and he buys it from us and he transports it, sells it to the grocery store, yada, yada. Trying to get us emotionally sympathetic towards those um, extended ecosystem of your company. And I don't think anyone is abrasive about the employees of Bud Light. People 
there might be one or two outliers. There are many, there are irrational people out there, but most people realize the, the people who are at blame for the specific marketing initiative are Alyssa Hireschild. Uh, what was that guy's name? Dennis, her manager, and then the CEO, Brandon Whitworth, which again, he's just advocating all responsibility, but it is moderately entertaining to see him kind of just jump in a pre rehearsed speech. It's just ridiculous. Now, other really fascinating cultural news, you have Google canceling Pride and Drag Show events, which is a first. If you look up on the Google, or rather on the YouTube, which they own, they actually hired many popular um, drag drag show, drag queens. The, the men the drag, the men who dress up as women with the, those, well, I don't know, all this vernacular is new to me. They hired many of those people um, to talk about Google security, which I sell cybersecurity. My, my company does a lot of cybersecurity services for top technologies. Maybe we need to work on our marketing, but we've never thought about hiring someone who has no experience with cybersecurity at all. A person dresses up and dances. It's almost as dumb as when I was a kid, I saw Brandon Kutcher doing an advertisement for Nikon cameras. You're, you're an actor. What do you know about photography? Nothing. You're just a pretty face. The same could not be said about the drag show performance or the, the act for cybersecurity. But and if you look at the ratios on, you know, they have the plugins where you see how many people disliked it. It was very unpopular. And of course, they had to disable comments, which is the sure sign that something is garbage if they're too afraid to leave the comment section open. I always leave our comment section open on this channel, partially because I appreciate your feedback. Another great example of the channel getting better over time. We got some improv teleprompters of my monitors in front of me so I could try to keep a little more eye contact. And that came because of some critique in the comment section. So when someone disables the comment section, I'm always immediately suspicious of what they're hiding or why are they, are they too afraid to debate their ideals, which is another sign of someone that someone is certainly wrong. Now, Google is dropping sponsorship of a myriad of Pride and Drag Show events and sponsorships after they got a petition signed by hundreds of workers who noted that it was a direct affront to the religious and sensitivity of Christians. So the religious beliefs and their sensitivity uh, representation of Christians in a pejorative way. Now, this is unprecedented in business as well as Google in general. Google is very much more on the left side of the political aisle. If you look at where they, I believe last analysis of, you know, what political campaigns they donate to, it was like 98% of, of the donations were for people on the left side of the political aisle, which that's not a very prudent business decision. In my, in my opinion, if you look at many traditional businesses, they'll donate to people on the left and the right of the political aisle because that way they have favors on both sides and kind of hedge your bets, so to say. Kind of like a bit, very similar to betting on both sides of a Super Bowl team. But this is the first time they've actually acquiesced from some of these events because their employees are saying they're religious police. It also shows you some of the diversity of Google. They have more employees than you possibly fathom. Probably more employees than most countries have in population. But people have this idea that it's a far left company. They only have people of one thought train. But they do have some many people, in fact, who have religious affiliations and beliefs. And it's interesting that we're starting to see this now because it's never been, ha this has never happened before, ever. Partially because I think a lot of employees are too scared for their job security or persecution. Because traditionally, if you say you're against something, like let's say, for example, if, you, if you're Christian or Catholic and you don't believe in a certain activity or a certain flag, you're immediately labeled a bigot, you're evil. You need to be re-educated, which... Is a fancy way of saying brainwashed and something that should scare a hell out of everyone when you hear that term because yeah 1984 is a very underrated book but traditionally they would be ostracized from society usually fired because again right now there's no and I'm, I'm one of those people where I, I think there should be much less involvement when it comes to governments and businesses but the one um, protected class in terms of being able to fire someone it is uh, political affiliations now you could probably make an argument for religious freedom in terms of if you look at political affiliations and religious freedom or religious beliefs i think you see more people on the right being much more catholic christian conservative and more on the left you see less religion in general which i think that, i think that'd be a fair assessment again on average so they might be able to kind of pseudo 
sue a company if they fired him for X because they brought a Y. But some of those interesting things where we're starting to see some companies backpedal. Now, in this specific instance, this was a protest against an event called, it was a, the San Francisco Pride event, which very low impact. There's like 12 people left in that city. Like every business is leaving in droves. It's, it's probably about half the content you've seen for the culture part of this podcast is the business is leaving fervently for a myriad of reasons, but they are self-inflicted. It's the culture they make. It's the culture they vote for. You get, you get what you vote for, right? It's one of those things where time shall tell if it, if the trend turns around and businesses are attracted, it, it might make it, we'll, we'll see. And again, I appreciate you staying with me. I know some of the feedback that I've gotten from the comment section is I derail a little bit and a little bit of ADHD, ADHD rather. I try to always keep it specific towards the topic that we're on, but I am aware of that just as I'm trying to aware of how to use my tone inflection a little bit better. So I appreciate the comments that you leave because it really does help the channel grow and develop. Now, getting back to the specific instance in San Francisco Pride event, it featured a drag qu- guy. I don't know if it's, they didn't say it was a queen. I thought they were all queens. Again, all this is new terminology to me. It's, so it's, apparently it's a drag queen by the name of, I'm not joking, Peaches Christ. Big red flag. Big red flag in terms of if you just have the word Christ in it, probably religiously affiliated. And of course, yeah, it's a pejorative representation of Catholicism, which for the past 50 plus years seems to be the punching bag of every cliche joke. It's actually the only thing you're it's culturally acceptable to make fun of. Now, critics noted that this person sexualized and disrespects Christian values and accused Google of religious discrimination for sponsoring the act. So this is interesting. Maybe in the past 12, 13 months, drag has embraced more mockery of Christian Catholicism beliefs. You saw this with the LA Dodgers sponsoring the, again, sorry, the ADHD, but pertinent, I think. You have the LA Dodgers where they actually had a pride event that was um, giving an award to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which quite literally is people in drag dancing and stripping on the cross, the crucifix of Jesus Christ. So that maybe that's why you're starting to see some of these pushback because it's more religious. But again, we only know this because of an internal memo that leaked from Google. And now they're no longer publicly sponsoring. They probably still give them money. But... It's also no longer on the internal employee bulletin, which fascinating to think like 10 years ago, like or maybe 20 years ago, businesses, like in, in terms of employee camaraderie and events, you'd have maybe a chess club or a fishing club. And it's interesting to see this cultural shift to these other activities. But again, I wonder, Google has thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees. Why now are they starting to shift? They have enough money, they can just pay these people off in terms of if the lawsuit comes, they'll just sell outside of court. They have billions of dollars in cash, or trillions actually. So why from a cultural perspective is Google starting to move a little bit? And again, it, it's not even an inch, it's a millimeter more towards the middle. And is this part of a long, a bigger trend, culturally speaking? That's gonna be the fascinating thing to look for in the next couple of months. And this even happened during Pride Month of all months which again, from businesses on LinkedIn and all over, you're seeing pull back a little bit on these initiatives. Partially, I feel, because many of them are not authentically believing in these things, which I find uh, very, I I despise charlatans and two-faced people and companies. If you believe for something, stand for it and follow through on it. My three cents. I know it used to be two cents, but inflation, 40 year high, it's been rough. Now, going on to the political part of the podcast, you have the feds, saying that they're probably going to ban the law that Florida passed in which they would no longer allow Chinese citizens to own land. Now, the Department of Justice this week said that the new signed law by Governor Ron DeSantis that restricts some Chinese citizens from owning property in Florida violates the federal law in the U.S. Constitution. The DOJ said in a quote, statement of interest filed in the U.S. District Court of Tallahassee that the legislation FLSB 264 23R, inspirational, I know. They say that it violates the Federal Fair Housing Act and Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. 
quote, these unlawful prov provisions will cause certain harm to people simply because of their national origin, contrarian, contravene federal civil rights laws and undermines constitutional rights and will not advance the state's purported goal of increasing public safety, unquote. Debatable, debatable, and I'll say why. Now, this is an instance where Florida passed a law that said foreign citizens of countries that are of concern would no longer be able to purchase U.S. land. Now, they, those countries include China, which you can say everything you want about Trump. He did kind of trademark that silly, uh, bombastic way of pronouncing the country. Uh, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Russia, Syria, Venezuela. So, countries of concern is a nice way, nice way of putting that. Although that being said, I wonder if it's a current. Because I was going to say, people who leave Cuba, they're not really citizens of those countries. My, like, not that my family doesn't have like a certificate that says they're still a citizen of Cuba. Probably because it's a communist hellhole and we wouldn't want to go back. But in terms of equality and security concerns, I think a big concern is the money behind people as well as the Chinese government. In terms of equality, you can't go to China and buy land. That is forbidden. You can't do that. But they can come here and purchase our land. And I think the concern or the maybe the national security concern is what if China just puts billions of dollars behind an individual and he buys up a bunch of land? You're seeing Chinese companies buying hundreds of acres, even in Oklahoma, of all places, all over the United States, and even close to defense manufacturers and uh, bases, which that should be illegal for a Chinese business to do that. that. I think that's something that people on the left might be able to agree with more in terms of uh, political unification on the chessboard. And that might be a more prudent long-term goal, but we'll see, <clears throat> we'll see how this goes back and forth with uh, DeSantis over in Florida. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, you have Yamaha killing their snowmobile product line. And Yamaha is probably one of the most diverse, fascinating companies of all time in terms of they make everything from pianos to trombones to trumpets to motorcycles, even car engines. And they do it all pretty darn well. I never had an issue with my uh, with my musical instruments back in the day. And my, I think my, yeah, yeah, my family still likes their, uh, Yam I believe it's a Yamaha piano. And they claim they're going to stop making snowmobiles after the 2025 model year. And this is especially interesting because they're one of the largest. In terms of, you look at the largest manufacturers of snowmobiles, they're up there. And they've been selling them for quite some time. They've been selling snowmobiles ever since the SL350, which kind of a marketing fail. If it should be SM, like snowmobile, that would have been a better idea, in my opinion. But... Nevertheless, the SL350 debuted in the United States in 1968. So it's been around for quite some time. And when they asked Yamaha for a comment, you know, what are your thoughts on this? They said, quote, going forward, Yamaha will concentrate management resources on current business activities and new growth areas or new, new growth markets, unquote. So I don't know why they're succeeding in this particular product category when there's so much potential and given politically speaking, we might have nuclear winter anytime soon. You never know. I mean, hazmat suits and snowmobiles might be the future. Again, I'm not a financial analyst or saying we should bet on that, but it'd be a grim bet to make. Now, thankfully, when asked for replacement parts, they said they were going to take care of the replacement parts for many years going forward. And hopefully that they are working with dealerships so that they won't have too much of a disruption in their business. And they, and they also make really good motorcycles too. So maybe, the, I don't know how so those dealers might pivot. It'd also be interesting to see the geographic location. Probably not a snowmobile dealership in like Texas, but I don't know. I've seen more bizarre things. But time shall tell. But to give up on such, such a, a product you've had for so long and so many people love, and that's just got to be the business blunder of the day. I just want to especially thank everyone for taking the time to tune in today. This is our 100th episode. And I really appreciate everyone taking time to like, subscribe, and comment. We're trying to get up to 3,000 subscribers by the end of July, and I think we can do it together. And every like, subscribe, it all helps out exponentially. Also, don't get to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone to stay safe and fight the good fight.